I came to the U.S. about three years ago. And the reason really was that I'd been spending like six or seven years at Helsinki University and decided that it was time to see the real world and not just university life. Especially this area had a lot of the most interesting work being done. So I just decided that let's try to move halfway across the, the world and give this a try. And it's turned out pretty well. Uh, do you see this as temporary or long term? Well, we saw it as temporary at first, and I think it's certainly looking like it's turning long term. Our youngest daughter is both a U.S. and a Finnish citizen because she was born here, and, and the older one is speaking both Swedish and English, so. The next major event was one that I had a direct hand in. I wrote a paper called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which was my observations, my anthropological analysis of what it was that made the open source world work. We didn't call it that then. We were still using the term free software primarily. So it was my observation of what made the free software world work and why we were able to produce extremely high quality software in spite of constantly violating all of the standard rules of software engineering. In that paper, I was setting up a contrast between two different styles of development, two opposed styles of development. One, which is the conventional closed development style, which I, I called the cathedral style. In that one, you have tight specification of objectives, um, small project groups which are run in a fairly hierarchical, authoritarian manner, uh, and you have long release intervals. On the other hand, what I identified as happening in the Linux world was a much more peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized market or bazaar-like style in which you have very short release intervals and constant solicitation of feedback from people who are formally outside the project, a very intense, intense peer review process. And the startling thing was that the more I looked at this, the more it seemed that trading away all the supposed advantages of conventional closed development for that one single advantage of massive independent peer review actually seemed to win, actually seemed to get you good results. The reason Netscape is important is that they were the first large company to participate in open source. We had Cygnus providing support, but we didn't really have much business. And Netscape went to open source essentially as a way to fight Microsoft, which was giving away Internet Explorer, but not letting anyone else have the source code, not letting companies collaborate. Working as part of the Salesforce, I got a good, I got a good idea of why people bought our software and what it took to make our software successful in the marketplace against competitive products. However, the problem was, we were seeing is that, is that as time went on, our software was uh, being competed against by other people's software, particularly Microsoft's. And as time went on, the price of our software had to drop because other people were giving their software away at, at no charge or at, or at little charge. Now, the real problem was that they feared that Microsoft would achieve a monopoly lock on the browser market, and they would then use that monopoly lock to uh, pervert, actually, the HTTP and HTML standards that the web depends on. And once they had t uh, turned those standards into lock-in devices, they could then use that control to drive Netscape out of the server market, which is where it was making its real money. My concern was that as time went on, Netscape's business would be threatened by the fact that we didn't have enough people to do all the things we needed to do as a company in order to keep our software viable in the marketplace. The Netscape release happened in early 1998. And uh, I was told later, I had no idea at the time, that it came about as a direct result of the right people having read The Cathedral and the Bazaar. The Cathedral and the Bazaar, the paper by Eric Raymond, was an a significant influence on Netscape's decision to release source code. Came as a complete shock to me. I wasn't really ready for the thought that I was changing the world, even by accident. 
However, it was not by any means the only influence on that decision, uh, and not necessarily the most important one when, when all is said and done. Uh, as I said, Netscape, Netscape had already been talking about releasing source code for quite some time before anybody had ever heard of Eric's paper. Linux Congress in early 1997, which was the first place that I gave that paper, and one of the people who heard it was Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Associates, and uh, he thought it was pretty intriguing. And he asked me to give it at his first Pearl conference, which was uh, later that year, in fall of 97. And apparently what happened, I was told later, although I had no idea this was happening at the time, uh, is that some people from Netscape actually heard the, the, the paper at the Pearl conference and took those ideas back to Netscape and they kind of lit a fire there. The role of my paper was essentially to make the internal case at Netscape, uh, to make the business case for why Netscape should release its source code. The paper was called Netscape Source Code as Netscape Product. Um, a strange title, essentially the, the, what the title meant was that, in my opinion, we, ne we needed to, to think of source code not just as something that was used in creating our products, but as something that was a product in its own right, something that customers might use, other people might use. I then looked at what the business models might be if we release source code for our products. How would we license them? How do we, how would we uh, sell products in this environment. Uh, then I looked at the competition, uh, particularly Microsoft. Uh, what would they be likely to do if we released source code? Was there some way they could use our source code against us? I used Eric's paper as an example of how distributed development could work, uh, how a company could develop software not just using their own people, but also working with people on the Internet. Uh, and I, that's why I included a reference to Eric's paper in, in my paper. Once my paper was circulated, the people who read my paper would naturally enough find a reference to Eric's paper and, and read that as well. And who was involved in making that happen in Netscape? Primarily, the person who made the actual decision was Jim Barksdale. Uh, and this turned out to be important later, that our big win, the big score that gave us mainstream visibility and credibility with investors, came not because of bottom-up evangelism from a bunch of engineers, but because one strategist at the top saw the potential power of this method and then essentially imposed that vision on everyone underneath him. When I completed the paper, I first gave a copy to Mark Andreessen, who was co-founder of Netscape and was, was at the time one of, in the senior management team at Netscape. Mark then gave a copy of the paper to several other people within Netscape management, uh, including Jim Barksdale, I'm not sure exactly when Jim and the other senior managers uh, made the actual decision. Uh, I believe it was in early January sometime. Uh, Netscape actually announced uh, that it was going to release the source code on January 22nd, at the same time that they released that they were going to give Communicator away for free. When Netscape decided to release the source code, uh, people sort of got a wake-up notice and said, you know, hey, maybe there is something to this idea of releasing source code and doing development with people outside your company. Um, so Netscape's decision brought a lot of public attention to the idea of free software, what, you, what became known as open source, and brought a lot of attention to the Linux operating system, which was one of the most prominent examples of open source software at that time. 